Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the October 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of certain features of the historical development of Marxism by Lenin from 1910. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this text is the 13th entry in the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide, which we've been doing on the channel over the past year and a half, along with many other side readings mixed in to expand on the background and just cover other topics. But this is a curriculum that comes from the organization MAI, Movimiento Anti-Imperialista, or Anti-Imperialist Movement, and it's a good way to learn basic Marxism-Leninism, so I'll put the link to that overall playlist in the description, along with the link to the original text. So this work was published in Zvezda No. 2, December 28, 1910, signed v. Ilian. It was published here according to the Zvezda text. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1974, Moscow, Volume 17. It was translated by Dora Cox, HTML transcription by R. Simbala. It's in the public domain at Marxist's Internet Archive, thanks as usual to Marxist's Internet Archive at Marxists.org, where they host thousands of free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. So let's get into the audiobook. Our doctrine, said Engels, referring to himself and his famous friend, is not a dogma, but a guide to action. This classical statement stresses, with remarkable force and expressiveness, that aspect of Marxism which is very often lost sight of. And by losing sight of it, we turn Marxism into something one-sided, distorted, and lifeless. We deprive it of its lifeblood. We undermine its basic theoretical foundations, dialectics, the doctrine of historical development, all embracing and full of contradictions. We undermine its connection with the definite, practical tasks of the epoch, which may change with every new turn of history. Indeed, in our time, among those interested in the fate of Marxism in Russia, we very frequently meet with people who lose sight of just this aspect of Marxism. Yet, it must be clear to everybody that in recent years, Russia has undergone changes so abrupt as to alter the situation with unusual rapidity and unusual force. The social and political situation, which in a most direct and immediate manner determines the conditions for action, and hence its aims. Quick note there, there was the first Russian Revolution in 1905. It was not fully successful, but they did set up Soviets, which were workers' councils for directing political activity after that. And then the fully successful revolution was in 1917. So this is 1910 in between those two. I am not referring, of course, to general and fundamental aims, which do not change with turns of history if the fundamental relation between classes remains unchanged. It is perfectly obvious that this general trend of economic, and not only economic, evolution in Russia, like the fundamental relation between the various classes of Russian society, has not changed during, say, the last six years. But the aims of immediate and direct action changed very sharply during this period, just as the actual social and political situation changed, and consequently, since Marxism is a living doctrine, various aspects of it were bound to become prominent. In order to make this idea clear, let us cast a glance at the change in the actual social and political situation over the last six years. We immediately differentiate two three-year periods, one ending roughly with the summer of 1907 and the other with the summer of 1910. The first three-year period, regarded from the purely theoretical standpoint, is distinguished by rapid changes in the fundamental features of the state system in Russia. The course of these changes, moreover, was very uneven, and the oscillations in both directions were of considerable amplitude. The social and economic basis of these changes in the, quote, superstructure, was the action of all classes of Russian society in the most diverse fields, activity inside and outside the Duma, or Congress, the press, unions, meetings, and so forth. Action so open and impressive, and on a mass scale, such as is rarely to be observed in history. The second three-year period, on the contrary, is distinguished, 
we repeat that we confine ourselves to the purely theoretical, sociological standpoint by an evolution so slow that it almost amounted to stagnation. There were no changes of any importance to be observed in the state system. There were hardly any open and diversified actions by the classes in the majority of the arenas in which these actions had developed in the preceding period. The similarity between the two periods is that Russia underwent capitalist evolution in both of them. The contradiction between this economic evolution and the existence of a number of feudal and medieval institutions still remained and was not stifled, but rather aggravated, by the fact that certain institutions assumed a partially bourgeois character. The difference between the two periods is that in the first, the question of exactly what form the above-mentioned rapid and uneven changes would take was the dominant, history-making issue. The content of these changes was bound to be bourgeois owing to the capitalist character of Russia's evolution, but there are different kinds of bourgeoisie, the middle and big bourgeoisie, which professes a more or less moderate liberalism, was, owing to its very class position, afraid of abrupt changes, and strove for the retention of large remnants of the old institutions, both in the agrarian system and in the political superstructure. The rural petty bourgeoisie, interwoven as it is with the peasants who live solely by the labor of their hands, was bound to strive for bourgeois reforms of a different kind, reforms that would leave far less room for medieval survivals. The wage workers, inasmuch as they consciously realized what was going on around them, were bound to work out for themselves a definite attitude toward this clash of two distinct tendencies. Both tendencies remained within the framework of the bourgeois system, determining entirely different forms of that system, entirely different rates of its development, different degrees of its progressive influence. Thus, the first period necessarily brought to the fore, and not by chance, those problems of Marxism which are usually referred to as problems of tactics. Nothing is more erroneous than the opinion that the disputes and differences over these questions were disputes among intellectuals, quote, a struggle for influence over the immature proletariat, an expression of the, quote, adaptation of the intelligentsia to the proletariat, as Vecchi followers of various hues think. On the contrary, it was precisely because this class had reached maturity that it could not remain indifferent to the clash of the two different tendencies in Russia's bourgeois development, and the ideologists of this class could not avoid providing theoretical formulations corresponding, directly or indirectly, in direct or reverse reflection to these different tendencies. In the second period, the clash between the different tendencies of bourgeois development in Russia was not on the order of the day, because both these tendencies had been crushed by the diehards, forced back, driven inwards, and for the time being stifled. The medieval diehards not only occupied the foreground, but also inspired the broadest sections of bourgeois society with the sentiments propagated by Vecchi, with a spirit of dejection and recantation. There's a footnote there. The diehards was the name given by Russian political literature to the extreme right-wing representatives of the reactionary landlord class. It was not the collision between two methods of reforming the old order that appeared on the surface, but a loss of faith in reforms of any kind, a spirit of meekness and repentance, an enthusiasm for antisocial doctrines, a vogue of mysticism, and so on. This astonishingly abrupt change was neither accidental nor the result of external pressure alone. The preceding period had so profoundly stirred up sections of the population who for generations and centuries had stood aloof from and had been strangers to political issues that it was natural and inevitable that there should emerge, quote, a revaluation of all values, a new study of fundamental problems, a new interest in theory, in elementals, in the ABCs of politics. The millions who were suddenly awakened from their long sleep and confronted with extremely important problems could not long remain on this level. They couldn't continue without a respite, without a return to elementary questions, without a new training which would help them digest lessons of unparalleled richness and make it possible for incomparably wider masses again to march forward, but now far more firmly 
more consciously, more confidently, and more steadfastly. The dialectics of historical development was such that in the first period, it was the attainment of immediate reforms in every sphere of the country's life that was on the order of the day. In the second period, it was the critical study of experience, its assimilation by wider sections, its penetration, so to speak, into the subsoil, into the backward ranks of the various classes. It is precisely because Marxism is not a lifeless dogma, not a completed, ready-made, immutable doctrine, but a living guide to action, that it was bound to reflect the astonishingly abrupt change in the conditions of social life. That change was reflected in profound disintegration and disunity, in every manner of vacillation, in short, in a very serious internal crisis of Marxism. Resolute resistance to this disintegration, a resolute and persistent struggle to uphold the fundamentals of Marxism, was again placed on the order of the day. In the preceding period, extremely wide sections of the classes that cannot avoid Marxism in formulating their aims had assimilated that doctrine in an extremely one-sided and mutilated fashion. They had learnt by rote certain slogans, certain answers to tactical questions, without having understood the Marxist criteria for these answers. The revaluation of all values in the various spheres of social life led to a revision of the most abstract and general philosophical fundamentals of Marxism. The influence of bourgeois philosophy in its diverse idealist shades found expression in the mockist epidemic that broke out among the Marxists. Commenting, that's a reference to Ernst Mach, someone who Lenin didn't uh, agree with that much. The repetition of slogans learnt by rote, but not understood and not thought out, led to the widespread prevalence of empty phrase-mongering. The practical expression of this were such absolutely unmarxist, petty-bourgeois trends as frank or shame-faced Otsavism, or the recognition of Otsavism as a legal shade of Marxism. On the other hand, the spirit of the magazine Vecchi, the spirit of renunciation which had taken possession of very wide sections of the bourgeoisie, also permeated the trend wishing to confine Marxist theory and practice to moderate and careful channels. All that remained of Marxism here was the phraseology used to clothe arguments about hierarchy, hegemony, and so forth that were thoroughly permeated with the spirit of liberalism. Boy, that sounds a little familiar. The purpose of this article is not to examine these arguments. A mere reference to them is sufficient to illustrate what has been said above regarding the depth of the crisis through which Marxism is passing and its connection with the whole social and economic situation in the present period. The questions raised by this crisis cannot be brushed aside. Nothing can be more pernicious or unprincipled than attempts to dismiss them by phrasemongering. Nothing is more important than to rally all Marxists who have realized the profundity of the crisis and the necessity of combating it for defense of the theoretical basis of Marxism and its fundamental propositions that are being distorted from diametrically opposite sides by the spread of bourgeois influence to the various fellow travelers of Marxism. The first three years awakened wide sections to a conscious participation in social life, sections that, in many cases, are now, for the first time, beginning to acquaint themselves with Marxism in real earnest. The bourgeois press is creating far more fallacious ideas on this score than ever before, and is spreading them more widely. Under these circumstances, disintegration in the Marxist ranks is particularly dangerous. Therefore, to understand the reasons for the inevitability of this disintegration at the present time, and to close their ranks for consistent struggle against this disintegration is, in the most direct and precise meaning of the term, the task of the day for Marxists. So that's the end of the audiobook. There is a footnote here, which I didn't read before, about Zvezda. So it says, Zvezda, the star, in which this article appeared, was a Bolshevik legal newspaper, the forerunner of Pravda, published in St. Petersburg from December 16, 1910, to April 22, 1912, at first weekly, then from January 1912 twice, and from March three times a week. On February 26, 1912, issue number one of Nevskaya Zvezda, 
was published at the same time as Vesda, and after the latter was closed down, continued its work. The last, the 27th issue, of Nevskaya's Vesda was published on October 5, 1912. Contributors to Zvezda were N. N. Baturin, K. S. Yeremeyev, N. G. Politaev, M. S. Olminsky, and others, including Maxim Gorky, whom Lenin enlisted as a contributor. The pro-party Mensheviks, Plekhanov's group, contributed to Zvezda until the autumn of 1911. Lenin gave the paper ideological leadership from abroad, and together Zvezda and Nevskaya Zvezda published nearly 50 of his articles. Under Lenin's guidance, the legal newspaper Zvezda became the militant paper of the Bolsheviks, which defended the program of the illegal party. Zvezda established workers' correspondence on a broad scale, maintaining strong and regular contact with the workers. Some of its issues achieved a circulation of 50,000 to 60,000 copies. The newspaper was the constant target of government repression. Out of 96 issues of Zvezda and Nevskaya Zvezda, 39 were confiscated and 10 were subject to fines. Zvezda paved the way for the publication of the daily Bolshevik newspaper Pravda, and on the very day it was closed down by the government, the first issue of Pravda appeared. All right, so that's the end of everything, footnotes included. What did you think? Leave a comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. So thank you very much for that. I really do appreciate them. If you'd like to help out without making a donation, liking, commenting, subscribing, clicking the notifications bell, and sharing the videos on your social media, particularly on Facebook where we have no presence right now is much appreciated and gets these videos in front of more eyeballs and expands the conversation. Otherwise, thanks for whatever you do online and in your community for spreading the ideas of socialism. Join an organization if there's a good one in your area and we'll catch you in the next video.